children. Psalm 91 through 7. seven. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Romans 8, 38 to 39. I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels, angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, ne neither height or, nor death, nor, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord.
Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Before your eyes I will repay Babylon and all who live in Babylonia for all the wrong they have done in Zion, declares the Lord. I'm against you, you destroying mountain, you who destroy the whole earth, declares the Lord. I stretch out my hand against you, roll you off the cliffs, and make you a burned out mountain. No rock will be taken from you for a cornerstone, nor any stone for a foundation. You will be desolate forever, declares the Lord. Lift up a banner in the land. Blow the trumpet among the nations. Prepare the nations for battle against her. Appoint a commander against her. Summon these kingdoms, Ararat, Midi, and Ashkenaz. For the Lord's purposes against Babylon to, to, to stand to lay waste the, the land of Babylon so that no one will live there. Psalm 25, verses 1 through 16. In you, O my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame, but shame will come on those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are my Lord, for, my, for you are my God and my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, Lord, remember me, for you are good. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful toward those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then are those who fear the Lord? He will instruct them in the ways they should choose. They will spend their days in prosperity, and their descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. God bless, bless you guys and raise you to use you for his kingdom. Um, if you will allow me, I'll share uh, the secret of how my kids started to say these verses. So we started this, I talked to my wife and we started this tradition of uh, telling the kids to learn one Bible verse per day, just memorize one Bible verse per day. And then they got, and that my goal was for them to open the scriptures every day. And uh, they got, competitive with each other and they wanted to memorize all the verses through the week and say them on Sunday nights. So that wasn't the initial intent. The initial intent was for them to open the scriptures and memorize one verse per day, but they want to keep going. So God bless them in that. And I hope they bless the church and make you guys uh, excited and happy. And I know it praises God. Sora Valley are o cantare pentru noi. În seara aceasta, după care fratele Liviu Apoi uh, uh, fratele uh, Petre are un, o cântare sau un îndemn.
păcătos, am fost când Iisus mă găsise. Chinuit, nespus de false lem greșeli, dar Iisus întinse mâna i salvatoare. Mi-a arătat apoi un drum ce duce în cer. Nu există prieten ca și Iisus, numai El păcatul mi-a spălat. Chiar durerea mea cea mare mi-o lua Bucuria mea cu Domnul e nespusă Și iubirea e tot mai mult o înțeleg Dar de ce s-a hotărât să mă salveze? Nu voi ști, dar sus în cer am să întreb. Nu există prieten ca și Iisus, numai El păcatul mi-a spălat. Chiar durerea mea cea mare mi-o lua Îmi place să am uh, predici lungi și uh, ăsta este motivul pentru care și dimineață mă uitam la ceas și vedeam un pic de presiune și am uh, uh, încheiat mai repede. Dar și-a vrea câteva gânduri aici tot în continuare la dimineață, pentru că faptul că nu suntem prea presați de timp astăzi, în după masa aceasta, și câteva gânduri, doar câteva precizări. <coughs> În primul rând, aș vrea să vă spun despre Betesda. Scăldătoarea Betesda de atunci nu era un loc așa ușor, un suim în micuț. E o clădire formidabilă. Cei de atunci trebuie să vă gândiți la niște bazine enorme de apă care alimentau templu, unde mergeau sute de mii de oameni. Discutăm acolo de zeci de tone de apă, cantitate foarte mare. Locul, ruinele unde este Betesda, acolo e probabil de patru ori cât clădirea asta. E o suprafață destul de mare, cu niște ziduri enorme, sunt niște ziduri înălțime de probabil 10 metri, 30 de fit în alte, groase, solide, bineînțeles că se văd doar ruinele acum, deci sunt niște construcții foarte, foarte serioase. Acolo era o cantitate mare de apă și 
Știm cu toții că apa face o presiune mare pe un zid care o oprește. Trebuia să fie ziduri serioase cu ilianturi foarte bune între pietre să reziste. Trebuia să fie izolat foarte bine, să nu curgă apa aiurea și să se țină acolo. Foarte interesant că acolo erau oamenii aceia despre care spuneam și zice Biblia, cu diferite boli și diferite neajunsuri de sănătate și fiecare spera, fiecare spera să ajungă la tremurul apei, să intre el primul acolo, să fie vindecat. Și așa cum fiecare dintre noi, săptămâna asta aceasta am fost un pic încercat așa de o răceală și ceva transpirație și... Așa înțelegeți și știți simptomele astea. Când te simți mai bine, am avut așa niște ore când, o, oh, parcă n-am nimic și pormă iar o revenit un pic. Din nimic așa, când te simți mai bine, vai ce bine este. Dar când ai o boală grea, o boală de care nu te poate scăpa nimeni și zaci acolo ani și ani și ani și ani, și nu găsește ajutor. Și cumva, cumva, de undeva, fie că ajungi primul în apă, fie că ajunge ziditorul Universului la tine și te cheamă și ai scăpat de boală. E ceva, e, e, e ceva sublim, e ceva, e ceva de nedescris. Și aș vrea un pic să... Apăs un pic aci lucrul ăsta. Cineva spunea, măi, dacă Domnul Isus m-a scăpat numai de tutun, numai dacă m-a scăpat de fumat și nu mai fumez, ce mare lucru în viața mea este. Și de câte alte lucruri ne-a scăpat Domnul Mântuitorul nostru. A venit în pridvorul nostru, să zic așa, între ghile mele, a venit în pridvorul meu și m-a scăpat de una, de alta, de alta, de alta, nu numai de fumat, de atâtea lucruri și merită să-i mulțumesc și merită să-i fiu de partea Lui. Și Domnul Iisus spuneam acolo că și-a început lucrarea cu slăbănogul ăsta, acolo la Betesda, dar a continuat, pentru că Domnul Iisus i-a zis, scoală-te, ia-ți patul, umblă și... Cumva spune Biblia că a plecat de acolo și nu l-au mai văzut, dar s-a dus în templu și vă spuneam că doar câteva sute de metri, probabil că în șapte, o minute, zece minute pe jos ajungi de la Betesda la templu, unde era acolo, era copola aia galbenă cu uh, 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 Dom of the Rock. Și acolo, bineînțeles că mântuitorul nostru știa, că vindecatul era acolo și îi zice, îi zice, iată că te-ai făcut, uitați-vă, citesc, e versetul 14, acum văd fără ochelare, mulțumesc Domnului, e interesant, iată că te-ai făcut sănătos, te-ai făcut sănătos, dacă aș fi eu, aș fi spus, Măi, nu e așa că e bine cum te-am ajutat și cum... Și Domnul Iisus, în gingășia lui de Dumnezeu, zice, iată, te-ai făcut sănătos. Și mai spune ceva, zice, să nu mai păcătuiești. Lucrarea pe care a început-o în Betesda o continuă în templu. Și vezi, tu... Slăbănogule, ai avut harul să te întâlnești cu Fiul lui Dumnezeu și până acum ai păcătuit mult, 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 ai fost rău, ai fost îndărădnic, așa cum și eu am fost și încă sunt, dar de acum înainte să nu mai păcătuiești, să nu ți se întâmple ceva mai rău, zice cuvântul acei. Probabil că 
continuând și nu probabil că din Biblie rezultă că continuând în păcat, păcatul ți aduce mult necaz în viață. Aduce păcat în familie, aduce păcat în biserică, aduce păcat, aduce rău, aduce necaz, aduce multe rele la lucru în societate, peste tot. Începând din lăuntru meu, din lăuntru, din tine, din lăuntru de acolo. Sunt multe păcate și, și mult rău care se răsfrânge în continuare. Ai grijă și poate că în tulburarea apei de aici din Betesda noastră, poate că ai grijă și să nu mai păcătuiești. Ai grijă și să fii cumva bun, să fii ascultător, așa și să nu uiți și să nu-ți scape lucrurile că El te-a vindecat și ți le-a vindecat pe multe și acum ești bine și ești sănătos. Te-ai făcut bine acum și Dumnezeu să ne dea, parcă așa am avut simțământul, să avem curajul și să vă încurajez să stăm pe calea Domnului, curați pentru El, vindecați dacă vreți și deasupra tuturor El iubindu-ne ne și folosește în lucrarea Lui, în harul Lui bogat, că El e minunat. El nu se oprește numai la scăldătoare, vine și la templu și te trimite și de acolo până la marginea pământului. Dumnezeu să ne vorbească mai mult și să fie cu noi. Amin. Parcă nu am curajul așa de mare ca să fiu după un rob a Domnului care are cuvântul lui Dumnezeu potrivit pentru fiecare care suntem aici. Dar spune cuvântul lui Dumnezeu despre un har a scăldătoarei pe care Domnul Isus sau în care, la care Domnul Iisus a dus să vindece pe omul acela. Este scăldătoarea Harului lui Dumnezeu care a ajuns până la noi în ziua de astăzi. Doar răspunsul la ceea ce Domnul Iisus întreabă este să ascultăm și să spunem, da, Domne Iisuse, vreau. Să te ascult. În dimineața, în, după masa aceasta, avem din partea lui Dumnezeu, în cartea salmilor, multe îndemnuri pentru viața noastră de fiecare zi, ca să fim plăcuți Domnului. În salmul 32 spune, ferice de omul, căruia nu îi ține Domnul în seamă nelegiuirea și în Duhul căruia nu este viclenie. Ceea ce spune salmistul sau învățătura din salmul respectiv este ca noi să-l folosim ca să putem avea parte cu Domnul Iisus în viața noastră de fiecare zi și apoi în veșnicie. Și cum putem să fim plăcuți lui Dumnezeu? În Salmul 1 spune, ferice de omul care nu se duce la sfatul celor răi și își găsește plăcerea în legea Domnului, el cugetă zi și noapte la legea lui. Și ar vrea ca să îi dăm viața noastră Domnului ca să se folosească de noi. Ar vrea să amintesc un verset special din Sfânta Scriptură, care Domnul Iisus în mod special îl spune bisericii lui, celor de atunci și nouă de acum. 
spune, vă dau o poruncă nouă, să vă iubiți unii pe alții așa cum v-am iubit eu. Și motivația pentru care Domnul Isus spune cuvintele acestea în Evanghelia după Ioana, capitolul 13, motivația pe care Domnul Isus o spune este ca să cunoască oamenii că sunteți ucenicii mei. Și aș vrea să cânt o cântare bătrânească, o cântare în care am cântat-o, fratele a spus despre oamenii care Dumnezeu a scăpat de multe patim și obiceiuri. Eu am fost fumător, cel puțin 20 sau 25 de țigări foloseam pe zi. Într-o zi am lucrat la, de fapt eu am fost în țară dulgher, constructor în țară. Și când mă gândesc așa, în timp ăsta, câte lucruri au rămas acolo și când am fost în țară le-am văzut, și așa cumva m-am bucurat. Eram la Iernut, la termocentrala de la Iernut, care s-a făcut, nu știu care, vă aduceți aminte, o termocentrală mare. Și uh, eram cu un coleg, eu eram pe un stâlp, la vreo 35 de metri înălțime, eu eram chiar pe colț, și el era lângă mine acolo. Și zice către mine, măi, Lazare, dăm o țigară, măi. Și i-am zis, neapodarul, eu nu am acum. Doar nu vrei să te pocăiești. Și i-am zis, știi ce? Și eu și tu trebuie să ne pocăim. Dumnezeu m-a scăpat de obiceiul și de băut și de câte lucruri că voi care v-ați născut în familie, voi habar n-aveți ce înseamnă viața în afară a bisericii, în afara lui Dumnezeu, a voiei lui Dumnezeu, a umbla fiecare de capul lui și cum vrea și cum gândește. Abar nu aveți ce înseamnă lucrurile astea. De multe ori mi-aduc aminte, sau ce vreau să vă spun, lucrurile de afară a lumii vin în mintea noastră fără să le căutăm. Toate lucrurile, obiceiurile și toate lucrurile nepotrivite vin în mintea noastră așa, ca un fulger, fără să le dorim. Dar cuvântul lui Dumnezeu trebuie căutat. Domnul Iisus spune, căutați-mă sau căutați și veți găsi, bateți și vi se va deschide. Cântarea pe care vreau să o cânt este pentru întărirea credinței noastre. Și o cântare bătrânească, dar e și pentru tineri care sunt aici și pentru noi, de toate vârstele de oameni, și spune 264. Credința mea eu o zidesc pe cuvântul sfânt și ceresc. Altceva trece ca spuma, Hristos ca stâng în veci va sta. Haideți să facem și colecta în timpul acestei cântări. <laughs> Credința mea eu o zidesc pe cuvântul sfânt și ceresc. Ale ce va trece ca spuma, Hristos ca sâncă în veci va sta.
versetul 4. Iar când Iisus va judeca și celor morți sus va striga, dreptatea Lui mie va fi mai răzutare Vreau să vă îndemn să ținem rugăciune pe copiii noștri, pe tineri care săptămâna asta sunt în vacanță. Ca un mic anunț, vorbeam cu tinerii să poate tentativ vineri să facem o ieșire pe apă la pescuit. Poate vine și sâmbătă. Vedem cum, cum merge programul și vom ține legătura. Să avem un timp plăcut împreună. Fratele Nicu are o cântare spre slava Domnului. le spunea că sunt cântări mai bătrânești și cântări așa mai lente. nu e adevărat, frate. Toate cântările sunt inspirate de Duhul Domnului. Și toate cântările ne vorbesc nouă. Și dar sunt cântări care, indiferent unde te afli, pe mașină sau în, în, în gămăruța ta, sunt cântări care îți vorbesc. Și sunt cântări care te apropie de Domnul și te face să te simți că ai greșit, te face să te simți, te, te cercetează și te întărește să mergi mai departe. Când au ieșit din Ierihon, o mare gloată a mers după Isus și doi orbi ședeau lângă drum. Ei au auzit că trece Isus și au început să strige. Ai milă de noi, Doamne, fiul lui David. Gloata îi certa să tacă, dar ei mai tare strigau. Ai milă de noi, Doamne, fiul lui David. Isus s-a oprit, i-a chemat și le-a zis, ce vreți să vă fac? Doamne, i-au zis ei, să ni se deschidă ochii. Lui Isus i s-a făcut milă de ei. S-a atins de ochii lor și îndată orbii și-au căpătat vederea și au mers după el. Domnul să ne ajute și Domnul să ne deschidă ochii în fiecare zi, să vedem ce e rău și să vedem ce e bine, să vedem adevărul și să-L urmăm pe Domnul Isus. Amin. Te ești trudit și ți-e grea povara, Nu vrei chiar astăzi să te ridici Iată e clipa hotărătoare Trece Iisus pe aici, trece El, trece El, cheamă și ce. Marea sa iubire Sau vei veni după har să strigi Iată că alții găsesc salvare Trece Iisus pe aici Trece El, trece El Cheamă și ce 
ce Iisus pe aici Ce vrei să-ți fac azi Iisus te întreabă Auzi tristul tău oftat Vino și spune ce te apasă să fii eliberat. Trece el, trece el, cheamă și cere îndurare, trece Iisus pe aici. Iisus pe aici Amin Haideți să deschidem cuvântul lui Dumnezeu în această seară la Cartea Exod Vom citi două texte. Unul este în capitolul 19, de la versetele 16 la 20. Al doilea este în Exod 33, de la 17 la 23. Deci Exod 19, de la versetul 16. Și dacă vreți să deschideți la, la 33... Uh, voi aștepta un pic. Haideți să ne ridicăm în picioare în onoare pentru citirea Cuvântului Dumnezeu. Exod 19, 16 la 20. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings in a thick cloud on the mountain in a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. In chapter 33, from 17 to 23. And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand, on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Before we... Uh, Get into the message tonight. I would like to ask Brother Nico to lead us in a prayer. Amen. 
ocupați locurile. So we had we had quite a few messages in Romanian today and I prepared my notes in English. I thought for a little bit, well maybe I should uh, do the message in Romanian, but we've had a lot of encouragements, so I want to make sure that all the youth here um, understand everything that, that we will be talking about tonight. So I have read these two texts, and as an introduction, I'd like to cover the, the immediate context of what is happening here. So we see uh, the people of Israel um, have left Egypt, and in their exodus, in their travel, they get to the wilderness of Sinai, to the foot of the mountain Sinai. And um, it's, it's very important for the people of God to understand what is happening here and what God is doing here for his, for his people. Um, we see two givings of the law. In these two texts, this is what, this is what the, the few verses that we have read this is what these texts are covering. Um, God, in his uh, mercy, bringing the people to the, to the foot of the mountain and giving them the law. We'll see that the first time we all know what the people of Israel do. And uh, Moses took a long time on the mountain, and we know that the people uh, got disgruntled, went to Aaron, and Aaron gave in right away took the gold from them and built them a golden calf. Moses comes down, uh, becomes very angry, uh, breaks the tablets of stone. So in chapter 33, we see God calling Moses again. Um, but tonight, I want us to look at three things. First is one that stares us in the face in the immediate literal context, and that is that God has to cloud his glory before men, otherwise they will die. We read in uh, chapter 33, verse 20, and I'll repeat it for us. But he said, you cannot see my face, for men shall not see me and live. Um, one, of the th one of the tools used in learning is uh, to teach by contrast. And tonight, I want us to uh, turn our Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Go to verse 27, 28, and 39. So just, just a few chapters before the first book. Just Genesis chapter 1, 27, 28, and 39. So verses 27 and 28 say, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then God continues, but verse 31 says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. The reason I want us to look here is because we see in God creating man, we see that God says everything was very good. When we move in Genesis in, in, uh, in uh, chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, we see that God comes in the cool of the day to have fellowship with men. And we understand from here that God... Adam and Eve were meeting each other. We know from that passage that by this time something grave had happened. And the reason I want us to look there is because we see there God, the creator of the universe. We see him in fellowship with his creation, with Adam and Eve. Then here, when we look at the, text, the two texts that we have read, especially Exodus 19, we see a totally different picture. So my question is, what has happened? Why does at this point in human history, in time and space, um, God has to cover himself in a cloud, in a mist, in a smoke? 
Uh, Brother Leview uh, reminded us this morning the same thing, that no man can see God and live. And beloved, the reason for why this difference, this contrast between God speaking with Adam and Eve freely at the beginning of creation and now God having to cloud himself as he does on Mount Sinai is the sin and the curse of sin. And you will always hear me um, focus on that because I believe again, and I, I, I know I'm repeating myself, but I, but I believe that if we do not have a, a really clear understanding of the state that mankind is after the fall into sin of our parents, Adam and Eve, um, we, t we tend to take lightly the amazing, majestic work of redemption g that God puts into motion because of uh, men falling into sin. So we know, and I've said this, that God created man to have fellowship with God. We also know that God did not need man, nor did he need the creation uh, to have fellowship with. He created because that was his good pleasure. And uh, although God promises Adam and Eve when he tells them out of this tree you should not eat, that because if the day you eat, you'll surely die, God in his mercy um, does not physically give them death at that point. But we see, we see again what happens because of, because of their sin. And um, one thing that we understand is that God is holy and sin cannot be in his presence. But we also see in this picture at Mount Sinai that God is merciful. And how do we see that? We see that God has already put forth a plan of redemption. God does what? He chooses a people. He takes them out of Egypt from slavery. He is bringing them into the, into the promised land. And at this point here, God is actually revealing his will for men through the law at Mount Sinai. And uh, my second point tonight is the immediate mercy God shows the people of Israel in revealing his will to them. And, that, and, and in thus doing, he is revealing his law, a law that ultimately points to Christ. And what I want us to look at tonight is, so we see this just terrifying picture. In, in uh, chapter 19, we see that there's sound of trumpets, there's smoke, there's fire. God is covered in a cloud. Uh, we see that the people tremble at this image. And again, we've, we've, covered, we've covered why that is. But God nonetheless, in his love, because of the promises he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Israel, because of those promises, because of the covenants, the covenant he made with Abraham, God is faithful and he is fulfilling his, his promises to them. Let's open Deuteronomy chapter 10 and look at God's choice of uh, how God speaks about his choice of the people of Israel. So De Deuteronomy chapter 10 verses 14 and 15. It says thus, Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth and with all that is in it. Yet the Lord set his heart in love upon your fathers. Literally, the translation saying, the Lord delighted in your fathers to love them and chose their descendants after them, you above all peoples as at this day. And this is God speaking to the nation of Israel. He is telling them that he delighted to love Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that is the reason God is doing what he is doing with bringing the people there, bringing the people to the mountain to give them the law, 
preparing to give to to bring his people into the, to, into the land of land of Canaan. In uh, Deuteronomy seven six and seven. If you want to open with me, Deuteronomy 7, 6 and 7. The Lord of God says this, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured, per, treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and he chose you for you were the fewest of the people of the peoples but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh king of Egypt so we see here that God set his love on them in verse 7, we see that, because, and in verse 8, the answer, he set his love on them because he loved them and because of their forefathers, because of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Isaac and Jacob. And God is not only choosing Israel, but as we said, he's leading them out of Egypt to the promised land. He's giving them the law, establishing the, the Levites as the administrators of the law. He is calling them to be holy, for he is holy. And I made a comment in, in, my, in my second point that this law that God is going to give the people of Israel at Mount Sinai ultimately points to Christ, ultimately testifies about Christ. And if we, if we open at Romans 3, verses 21 and 31, we will see what the Apostle Paul has to say about this righteousness that the law and the prophets testify about. So Romans 3, let's start with verse 20 since it's, it, 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 it's very important in the context. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short, fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his, in his divine forbearance, forbearance, he has passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so, they, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we hold that no one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Where is God the, the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one, he will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through, through faith. Do we then overturn the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. So we said we we said that we we're going to look at the righteousness that the law that God God gives us as Mount Sinai to show, and we see here the purpose of the law. In verse twenty, we see that the purpose of the law is to do what? Let's read it again. It's to it's to make us conscious. Of sin, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes what? Knowledge of sin. So the consciousness of sin. What happens, though, 
because to me, it's always amazing when we look back at the old covenant and we see the mercy and the grace of God that he shows to the people of Israel, leading them by, by a pillar of fire at night, by a cloud in the day, uh, showing his glory. We, we tremble in fear at Mount Sinai, but we see throughout the history of the, of the uh, nation of Israel, we see a lot of, a lot of struggle a lot of unbelief, a lot of heartache from God because of their uh, disobedience. And we always ask ourselves, what happened? How can God reveal himself in such amazing ways and the people still, still stumble, still, still not obey this God and, 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 and follow him? And I think if we go to Romans um, 9, let's open to Romans 9, 30 and 33. We see what happened to the, to, to the Jewish people as a nation. We, we obviously know, and I want to I wanna, I wanna make this clear, we know that there were a lot of um, children of God in the nation of Israel. We know how they were children of God because Hebrews chapter 11 makes very clear to us when we have that big cloud of witnesses. Um, it says, for every name that the word of God uses in that chapter, in chapter 11, it says, by faith they did this. By faith Abraham believed God. By faith all of the prophets that were uh, sought in two, that were killed, that were all of them by faith. This faith was in the, common, in the coming Messiah. But what happened to the rest of the nation that were unbelievers, and we see even here, we have been given account, I believe, uh, as far as fighting men that came out of Egypt at the census, uh, fighting men of Israel from the 11 tribes, because the Levites were not to be fighters, they were not to be warriors. The count, I believe, was 603,000 fighting men. And uh, that's not counting against the tribe of Levites. It's not counting the, the older men. Uh, it's not counting the women. It's not counting a lot of the people. So it's a great number of people. We know in 1 Corinthians 4, we understand this tragic, and, and, and the Apostle Paul is using this as a warning for us. We understand that all of those that came out of Egypt that were at that age perished in the wilderness. Because in, in Hebrews chapters 3 and 4 tell us why, because of their unbelief. But let's look even deeper. So Romans 3, um, uh, Romans 9, verse 30 and 33. 233. And Romans chapters 9 through, through 11 is Paul, um, Paul's uh, argument, Paul's desire to see the people of Israel uh, saved. Um, he, we know that his heart aches because of his brethren. And he wants, he would rather see himself separate from, from Christ to see them uh, come to God. But this is, this is what the Apostle Paul says. Um, Romans 9, chapter, uh, 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 verses 30 to 33. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it? That is a righteousness that is by faith, but that Israel who, pers who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law? Why? The Apostle Paul always, always expects a question coming. He sets up a thesis and then he expects a question coming. So, so the Apostle asks, asks he, he, here why? And this is the answer. Because they did not pursue it by faith, but, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone as it is 
written, and this is a quote from Isaiah, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So what is the answer? The answer is the same, and it's sad, but the answer is the same for every other religion in the world. We know the people of Israel had the law, had the prophets, had the sacrifices, had later on the kings, uh, had everything, had the scriptures. But instead of them looking at the word of God, looking at the law that God is giving them and seeing what God points towards, they have taken this law and they wanted to attain righteousness by their own works. This is what the Apostle Paul is saying here. And if we look at every other religion in the world, what, and we talked about this at Sunday school this morning, what is in every other religion, who is the savior? Yourself. You, through your works, will attain entrance to God, eternal life, whatever you want to call it. As, but we see tonight, and that's what I want us to see tonight. We see that this righteousness that the apostle says in Romans 3, uh, that the law and the prophets testify about is a righteousness that comes by faith, by faith in the work of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And why? Why do you think a perfect sacrifice was necessary? And the scripture gives us the answer. We could not on our own pay that penalty. In our sinfulness, we did not even see how deep we were into, to say, into trouble with God. But we see, we see mercy in the fact that God saves through the same righteousness, through the same faith, saves both Jews and Gentiles makes out of two people, as it says in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter two, out of two people, he tears down the wall of division and out of two people, he makes one. Um, another, another point that I wanted to cover, the, the stumbling block that the apostle Paul is talking in, in, um, in chapter nine and this is one thing that we should pray, especially for the nation, for the, for the people of Israel today, is that that stumbling block in Zion is still a stumbling block for a lot of the Jews today. Brother Levi, you can probably attest to that. Not a lot of Jewish people in Israel are, are believers in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, right? And that is one thing that should lay heavy on our heart because God in his mercy and his grace has shown his love to us, has called us out of the world, has given us the benefits uh, that Christ uh, merited on our behalf on the cross at Calvary. In chapter 3, we, we, we read that God made him, the, uh, in Romans chapter 3, we read that God made Christ the propitiation. Propitiation mean, means that Christ satisfied God's righteousness by his blood he cleansed us um, my third point for tonight is so I want to and, and I don't think we have that much time but um, as understanding the fulfill the fulfillment of the covenant God made with Abraham the first covenant in the story of redemption looking at the concept of picture language and ultimately seeing and savoring our Savior, Jesus Christ, and how God, in his infinite mercy, placed us in him as he placed Moses in the cleft of the rock. So we looked at Deuteronomy chapter 7, chapter 10, uh, where the covenant made with the fathers, the patriarchs, is the basis on which God is ultimately dealing with the nation of Israel, as we read in our text in, in Exodus. Um, so actually what is happening then at the Mount of Sinai God, God is entering into covenant with the people of Israel Moses being the mediator 
before the second giving of the law, for example, we see uh, Moses interceding on behalf of the Israelites. And what does he say? And that is something that, that, that stuck with me. Two things that stuck with me in that passage. What does he say? Blot out my name from your book that you have written, but do not destroy these people. And God is telling Moses, because you have found favor in my eyes, I turn my anger and I will not kill these people. We see that um, Moses, still very angry, calls the Levites to him and 3,000 people in one day die by the sword because of their sin. Um, but nonetheless, it is Moses that inter intercedes for, um, for his people before God. God does not, in, his, in, the, in, the, in the translation says, God burned in his anger against the people for, the, for, their, for their sin. We see that God turns away from his anger and actually in the second, in that second giving of the law in chapter 33, we see God speaking in a different way. We don't see uh, as much of the, uh, on the blast of the trumpet. We don't see as much of the fear and trembling, but we see God in a more, um, in a more merciful and gracious way uh, we see him, we see Mo, and the second thing that, that really struck me is the fact that Moses asks the Lord to show him his glory. Um, and I pray that, especially for the youth, but for all of us, that our desire will be constantly to behold God's glory. We know that, that one day when we would have, we would be with Christ. Uh, especially waiting for that day, that resurrection day, when we have new bodies, we will behold his glory. But Moses, says, asks, uh, Moses asks God, show me your glory. And we see God's response. No man, again, because of sin, no man can see my face and live. Um, so I want us to look a little bit at Genesis 17, when God reinforces his covenant with Abraham. And um, let's go to Genesis 17, chapter, uh, uh, verses 4 and seven, to 7. So this is, in Genesis 15, we have God making the covenant with, uh, with Abraham when, when God puts Abraham to sleep. Uh, after Abraham cuts the animals in halves and God himself walking between, putting Abraham to sleep and God himself walking between the pieces of those animals. That's signifying in that time, um, I don't know how, how, how many um, have understood in history the way those covenants were made between kings and, and, and vassals. So were, were between king and king, um, they, would, they would split an animal in half, and each part of the covenant would walk in between. And the saying would, would go, if I break this covenant, I should be like that animal split in half. That was the, from, from historically, that is, that is how the people of Israel, well, the, not the people of Israel, but Abraham, Abraham understood that covenant. And what's amazing there, God making that covenant with Abraham is that God himself puts Abraham to sleep and he is saying ultimately, I should be. God cannot be. God is perfect in his holiness. God is immutable. He's not bound by time and space. God cannot, the concept of God dying cannot even, doesn't even, doesn't exist because God is so majestic. But that's what literally the literal interpretation of the blazing pot going between the between the animals is that God is putting himself as a guarantor that that covenant will be fulfilled and in that what I want us to see in the covenant with Abraham is that God makes makes a few promises to Abraham um, the ones that we'll focus tonight is first for the descendants from the bloodline of Isaac, the people of Israel. And that promise is what we see 
God fulfilling at Mount Sinai uh, and, and in the history of the people of Israel, giving them the land of Canaan. Actually, in, in Joshua chapter 24, it's amazing because God says, in everything that God promised Moses, he fulfilled. And a lot of people will say, well, so, okay, that's it. It ends here. No, because the promises were multiple. So one thing God promises to Abraham is that um, the, he, will, he will give them descendants as, as, as numerous as the, as the stars in the sky. Uh, another, promise is, another promise is that every nation will be blessed because of Abraham's, off, Abraham, Abraham's offspring. And that offspring is what I want us to, to, uh, to look at tonight. So I said uh, Genesis, 4, uh, Genesis um, 17, 4 and 7. This Bible is very hard to turn pages. Okay, so Genesis 17, verses 4 and 7. Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abraham, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of, mo of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you, and I will establish my covenant between between me and you, in your offspring, after you, throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And then he, he goes into the, to the, to the promises that, that, that he makes for the physical land and, and a physical nation. But I mentioned this concept of picture language. And one thing that, that we see here and this is what I, what I want to end with. Um, when, we see, when we see the promise that God makes with Abraham, that many nations will be blessed in him, your offspring, ultimately um, God is promising Abraham the Messiah. God is promising that offspring that, that God is talking about is Jesus Christ. From the lineage of, we all know in the, from the lineage of Abraham, is the, the Messiah to be born. In the Messiah, in Jesus Christ, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. But the picture language that I want us to look at tonight is God is asking, uh, Moses is asking God to show him his glory. And God is telling him there's a place on the rock. I will, I will place you here in the cleft of the rock. And you will see, and I will cover you, and you will see my backside. This is a picture of what God has done with us in Christ. He has taken us and he has placed us in his son Jesus Christ. We would have never been able to fulfill God's requirements of righteousness that he gives us in his law. But God in his grace and mercy takes us and puts us as his people in Jesus Christ. As we said, both Gentiles and Jews together um, covered in this beautiful Savior. One of the, um, one of the things that, um, that a lot of people miss and uh, as far as, as as far as picture language language or types and shadow uh, types and shadows um, types and shadows signify where especially the the typology of the Old Testament signify where God has presented the gospel uh, in the Old Testament but in our churches in the, in the year 1226 there was a teacher uh, that said well we should not look at the Old Testament as far as the types go, the type of Christ, unless a New Testament author is uh, saying that that is a type. And so that was a good rule, but at the same time, the church, and this is what, uh, what uh, people in seminary, I mean, uh, pastors in seminaries are learning even today, 
But I think what has happened by applying that rule across the board, we miss seeing Christ. And the, and the name of that teacher, I believe, is Marsh in 1226. But um, you can search for yourself. But one of the things that we miss by doing that is we miss seeing Christ. Uh, one, of the, one of the most beautiful pictures, for example, as far as picture language goes or typology goes, is uh, Joseph. Joseph was a representative of Christ. David, the king, as a, rep, uh, as, a, as, a, as a type of Christ. Obviously, all these men were fallen in their humanity. And in the end, we know that no, no types that God uses in the Old Testament rise up to the level of our Savior, Jesus Christ. But that's what they do. They point towards Christ. And uh, I want to leave us... I want to I want to leave us tonight meditating on um, um, a passage from Hebrews chapter 12, 18 to 29, which ties in with um, very good with uh, with that picture that we have seen in uh, in uh, the giving the giving of the law at Mount Sinai, especially the one from uh, from um, 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 from chapter 19. So Hebrews 12, 18 to 29. For you have not come to what may be touched by a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further message be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if, if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised. Yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, us, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. So if I were to conclude what I, what I, uh, what I tried to say tonight, is that the, God, the, 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 the covenant that God made with Moses at Sinai was one step in God fulfilling his promise of redemption to mankind. Was one step, if we were to go to see how Paul argues in um, Galatians, he says that the law was a tutor until the, the, the real master would come, which would be Christ. Um, we today, both Gentiles and Jews, are beneficiaries of this amazing new covenant. Therefore, let us be grateful for, receive, for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. The book of Hebrews, um, up to this point, is describing the sacrificial system in Israel. It's describing how the old covenant works, how the priesthood work, how everything worked. And it comes here almost as a conclusion that this kingdom that God established, this covenant that God established in Jesus Christ, 
in which we are blessed, brothers and sisters, is a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And this is the promise of God. We should, therefore, be grateful for that and live to show the evidence that God has, as, as Brother Liviu and Brother Peter have spoken tonight, that God truly transformed our lives, that God truly changed our lives, not out of fear, but out of love, because he first loved us. God bless you. Uh, let's, with, uh, let's stand up. Let's end with a word of prayer. If anybody has any announcements, anything that has been missed, um, okay. Brother Mircea, you want to lead us in, in a final prayer?